God is the God of new beginnings, second chances, and fresh starts. God is the God of glory days. And if you could use some, welcome to the study of Joshua, the life and the book, the story of how God brought a nation of people into the promised land. And we believe that what he did then, he does still. And if you could use some glory days, then this story is for you. Join with me in our glory days declaration. The words will appear on the screen. I need you to fill your lungs with air. I need you to fill your hearts with hope. Say it like you mean it. These days are glory days. My past is past. May what we say today, Lord, go deep in our hearts. Change the way we think, please. Activate hope where there is nothing but discouragement. Grant us courage where there is nothing but fear. Let the message of Sunday be the lifestyle of Monday. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, New York City. If you want a view of the skyline, go to the Empire State Building. For entertainment, go to Broadway. You want to shop? There's some stores on Fifth Avenue just waiting on your credit card. Need some inspiration? Tour the Statue of Liberty. But if you want to be discouraged, utterly depressed, totally overwhelmed, absolutely distraught, then take a cab to the corner of Sixth Avenue and 42nd Street And spend a few moments standing in the presence of the national debt clock. The sign is 25 feet wide. It weighs 1,500 pounds. It uses 306 bulbs to constantly, endlessly, mercilessly declare the national debt in each family's share. The sign can run backwards, but the feature has never been needed. Plans are afoot to expand the sign to make it able to broadcast a figure of quadrillions of dollars. Now, I'm not an economist. I'm a preacher. But it seems to me if you owe more than you own, you're in trouble. I'm not an economist. I am a preacher, which may explain the odd question that popped in my mind as a few months ago I stood in front of the sign and I wondered, does heaven have a sign like this. Not for fiscal debt, but for spiritual debt. You've noticed how often the Bible uses financial terms to describe sin. Jesus taught us to pray, forgive us our debts. Debt, a sin is a debt, something we owe to God. So if sin is a debt, do you and I have a dot matrix trespass counter in heaven? And every time we sin, click, 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 click. Tell a lie. Click. Greedy thought. Click. Lose your temper. Click. Cut someone off in traffic. Click, 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 click. click. (laughs) Talk about depressing. A financial liability is one thing, but a spiritual liability is serious matter. According to Scripture, sin has a serious consequence. It actually separates us. It creates a separation between us and God. Your iniquities, the Bible says, have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden His face from you so that He will not hear. See, the economy of heaven comes down to one thesis, and that is heaven is a perfect place to be inhabited by perfect people, which really leaves us in a perfect mess because we're anything but. According to heaven's debt clock, we really owe more than we could ever pay. And every day brings more sin, more debt, and more questions like the question of the Apostle Paul who said, who will deliver me? Joshua asked a similar question, not about sin, but about a river. The context of Joshua is this. 
The book of Joshua describes the exit from the wilderness and the entrance into the promised land. It is comprised by seven years of almost uninterrupted victory in which the wilderness wanderings ended and the promised land inhabitation began. The question we're asking as we read through the book of Joshua is, what did they know that we could know? What did they do that we could do that could allow us the privilege of living a victorious Christian life? Not a wilderness Christian life, but a victorious one where we truly know more victories than defeats, feel more strength than discouragement, more breakthroughs than breakdowns. I think one of the answers is found in this particular story, the story of the Jordan River. The Jordan River separated the children of Israel from the promised land, just as sin separates us from God. They needed a miracle to get through the river. We need the same. They received one. We did too. Their deliverance is a picture of ours. You like to fill in the blanks? Here's your cue to grab your outline, your pencil, your mascara stick. Blank number one. Let's talk about the impossible task. The impossible task. The Hebrew people had never crossed the Jordan, ever, ever. Even when Joshua and Caleb and the other ten spies scouted out the land some 40 years earlier, they came up through the south, up north, over land. Now the children of Israel were going from the east westward over the water. They had never done this. But still, the first command of God to Joshua was, Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people. No small task. During most of the months of the year, the Jordan River was about 30 or 40 yards wide, about six feet deep. But during this time of year, the season of harvest, the Jordan River swelled to, get this, a mile wide, a mile wide, think Mississippi River, think Amazon, a mile wide, and it was turbulent with the melting snows of Mount Heron. Crossing a swollen current was no small task, especially with two million people. God said, go over this Jordan, you and all this people. God wanted everybody to get across, everybody, every man, every woman, the elderly, the young, the strong, the hardy, the weak, the disabled. No one would be left behind. Joshua might well have gulped at this command, but to his credit, he went straight to work. Joshua rose early in the morning, and they set out from Acacia Grove and came to the Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they crossed over. So they lodged there. They spent, if you remember, they spent three days there. They pitched their tents on the eastern side of the Jordan River, three days, plenty of time to ask plenty of questions. How are we going to get across? Does anybody have a boat? Is anybody going to build a bridge? Three days, plenty of time to look at that swollen current of copper-colored waters and yeasty waves carrying the debris from the high country. From three nights they slept, or at least they tried to sleep. The only sound was the rush of the water all night long, three days. How would a nation of people cross a flooded, bridgeless, boatless river? Well, on the third day, the answer came. Blank number two you want to fill in is this. Look at the improbable path. The improbable path. Officers went through the camp and they commanded the people saying, when you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priests, the Levites bearing it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. The ark of the covenant. Remember the Ark of the Covenant, raiders in search of the... Yeah, we're talking about the same box here. It was not a large box, three feet, nine inches tall, two feet, three inches wide. Within this box were three Hebrew artifacts, a gold jar, 
of unspoiled mannon, Aaron's walking stick that had budded long after it had been cut, and the precious stone tablets that had felt the engraving finger of God. A heavy golden plate set over the top. It was called the mercy seat. It was a lid to the chest. Two cherubim, two angels of gold with outstretched wings faced each other and looked down on the golden lid. And it was considered that the dwelling place of God was right there between the two angels. So for God to say, follow the ark, was actually for God to say, follow me. Follow me. The ark was going to go first. God was going to lead the way. Not Joshua. Not a corps of engineers. Not military personnel. God would lead the way. When it came time to pass the impassable, God was going to lead the way. They were told to wait until the ark of the covenant appeared. What a scene that must have been. On the day that it did. At the close of three days, there was a stirring in the Hebrew camp. A chosen band of priests, barefooted and robed in white, walked toward the river. On their shoulders, they carried the ark with the acacia poles that ran through the rings on the corners. People stepped out of their tents and watched in hushed silence as the priests inched their way toward the river and walked their way down the terraced bank of the Jordan. The only sound was the fury of the water, and the water did not let up. Thirty feet out, still a rushing river. Twenty feet out, still roaring waves. Ten feet out, still a mile wide. Five feet out, how are they going to do this? Don't you know at about two feet, those priests began to look at each other. I mean, they're carrying the chosen, the most choice relic in the nation of Israel. They're about to wade into a wild, white-watered, furious river. What if they lose it? Don't you know they wondered, should we proceed? That's when they remembered the instruction of Joshua. When you have come to the edge of the water of the Jordan, you shall stand in the Jordan. And they did. The the scripture says the feet of the priest who bore the ark dipped in the edge of the water. I appreciate the honesty here, don't you? They just dipped in. They didn't run, plunge, or dive in. They placed ever so carefully the front edge of their big toes in the water. It was the smallest of steps. But in God's plan... The smallest step of faith can result in the greatest of miracles. Because as they touched the water, a miracle was activated and the river stopped. It's like someone shut off the water main. The waters which came down from upstream stood still and rose in a heap. Very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zaratan. Zaratan, that's 30 miles upstream. 30 miles upstream. In my childhood imagination, I remember hearing this story thinking they could walk and they could just touch the water as they walked across. Well, I guess they could have if they were 30 miles upstream. God created a swath wide enough for all the children of Israel to cross over the Jordan River and cross they did and all Israel crossed over on dry ground until all the people had crossed completely over the Jordan. All Israel crossed over. The men, the women, the old, the young, the strong, the feeble, the forceful, the doubters, the faithful. All of them crossed over. Did you see it? On dry ground. On dry ground. Might as well have been a highway. Might as well have been concrete. They crossed over on dry ground as they stood on the western shore. They had no mud on their sandals, no water on their robes. They had no doubt in their hearts. They received the unmistakable message, the unmistakable 
message. God did for them what they could not do. God did for them what they could not do. Our question is, what did they know that enabled them to route, to run the table in the land of Canaan over the next seven years? I think this is a big part of the answer. If God could turn a raging river into a red carpet, watch out, Jericho. Here we come. As their leader had promised, by this crossing, you shall know that the living God is among you. The miracle was a message. The deliverance was a demonstration. Imagine the Israelites as they stood on the western side of the Jordan River. Don't you know there were a few high fives? Don't you know there were a few men alive? Don't you know they were brimming with confidence, standing in awe of God? Don't you know they looked at their enemies with different eyes? God got them in. He would stand them up. He got them through the Jordan. He would lead them into battle. How did they lead their way into Canaan with such confidence? Simple. They they had experienced deliverance. And they knew down in their core they did nothing to deserve it. But God did it all. And they knew God was with them. It was like they were running a relay race and God handed the baton for the final lap with an eight-lap lead. They couldn't lose. They're on a bicycle race downhill with the wind to their back. They won the lottery. They didn't even buy a ticket. They were dealt four aces. They're playing with house money. They didn't know how not to win. They had every right to celebrate. So do we. Can I talk to you for just a minute about your Jordan and mine? The name Jordan in Hebrew, in the Hebrew language, means wide judgment. Wide judgment. Jor means spread or wide. Dan means judging. So Jordan is a picture of the judgment of God. Mile wide, turbulent torrential, impossible to cross on our own. It separates all people from the promised land. We cannot cross the river without help. God is holy. We are not. His character is flawless. Ours is flawed. He is sinless. We are sinful, sin-filled, and our sins rack up a debt faster than the U.S. government racks up a debt. Theology 101 starts right here. How can a sinless God receive sinful children? Maybe he'll just pretend we never sinned. Maybe he'll turn his back on our sin. Maybe he'll just gloss it over and say, oh, boys will be boys, girls will be girls. Maybe he'll just pretend we never sinned and heaven will be inhabited by people who bring a lot of sin in with them. The problem with that is that the Bible describes God as a God of justice, judgment, justice. He must judge or he is not just, right? A just judge Judges sin. A just judge must judge what is wrong. At least that's what the judge told me. I stood in front of a judge once. I was in college. I received a parking ticket for parking in a no parking zone. I did not know I had parked in a no parking zone when I came back to my car and saw the parking ticket on my windshield I looked for a sign I didn't see it but then I saw oh the curb is red actually it was pink the sun had bleached it a bit and I thought to myself I think I have a case here so I went to municipal court I it's not that I didn't have five bucks but I really didn't have five bucks to spare for the ticket and a guy's got his pride right And I thought, well, I can talk my way out of this. And so I appeared before a judge. And he looked like a judge, bearded, stern-faced, robed. I pleaded my case. I told him how the red paint 
had turned pink. He was unimpressed. I told him, I'm a pretty good guy. I'm a college student. I'm on a budget. I told him, I'm making good grades. I am told him, told him, otherwise, I'm, I'm really a good driver. I told him all the reasons he should dismiss my penalty. He finally spoke up, asked me one question. Did you park in the no parking zone? <laughs> yes, sir. He slammed the gavel, just like they do on TV. He slammed the gavel. There you have it, he said. I had to pay $5. I couldn't escape the facts. Didn't matter if the paint was pink. Didn't matter if I was a good guy. At the core of the issue was this. I, I, I broke the law. Mustn't the just judge punish my crime? If he is just, he must. Mustn't a just God punish our sins? We can't escape the facts. We've all violated the law. We all have. Sometimes we thought the paint was pink. Other times we knew it was red and we did it anyway. But we broke the law of our conscience, the laws of society, the laws of morality, but ultimately the law of God. And now we stand before a Jordan River. Why judgment? On the wrong side, promised land is over there, we're over here. What are we going to do? Scripture says that God will judge everyone according to what they have done. Well, that's not hopeful. The clock clicks, the river rages, and we congregate on the water's edge, and we look across this Amazon of God's judgment, and we ponder our predicament. How are we going to reach the other side? For Joshua's people, the answer came in the form of priests shouldering an ark. For us, the answer comes in the form of Jesus Christ shouldering a cross. The priests descended into the Jordan. Jesus ascended onto Mount Calvary. The priests stepped into the angry river. Jesus stepped into the anger of humanity where they threw him on the ground and they pounded nails in his hands and his feet. And they lifted the cross up into the air so high it eclipsed the morning sun and they plunged it into the soil. The most severe torment, however, came not from the cruelty of the soldiers, but from the punishment of God. For God caused Christ, who himself knew nothing of sin, to actually be sin for our sakes, so that in Christ we might be made good with the goodness of God. Our debt had to be paid, right? Justice demanded that our sins be punished, and that day... They were. They were. Our sins were punished. Jesus took the punishment for us. He stood beneath our sin clocks. And he announced to the tribunal of heaven, I'll take the punishment. I'll pay the debt. There is no denial of sin. Yet there is no punishment of our sin on ourselves. Christ sufficiently paid the debt. He sufficiently endured the punishment. The justice of God was satisfied. And the mercy of God was spread wide, wider than the wide river of God's judgment. In the Jordan River moment, the priests stayed in the river until every person had crossed over. In our case, Jesus stayed on the cross until he could cry out, it is finished. It is finished. He left nothing to chance. No work was undone. Every law was satisfied. Every objective was attained. The river we could not cross, he crossed it. The tide we could not face, he faced it for you, for me, for all of us. Our deliverance was complete. 
For it is by grace that you have been saved. Through faith, this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by works, so no one can boast. No Hebrew stood on the western side of the Jordan and said, look what I just did. Right? No one said, did you see me paddle the boat? No one said, did you see me swim? (laughs) No one said, look what I just did, because they did nothing. What they did say was, look what God just did. No Christian who gets grace can ever say, look what I just did. Rather, they live with this This awe that says, look what God did for me. You see, we entered Canaan by the goodness of God. We did not swim a stroke. We did not paddle a boat. But God decided to take us from one side to the other and did so in such a way as to satisfy every demand Every requirement. His justice is ratified. Our debt is satisfied. His love is magnified. Our souls are miraculously sanctified. And our victory is clarified. Like the Hebrew people, we are dramatically delivered. I think the Hebrew people marched into Canaan with a bit of a swagger. Because of what God had just done for them. Have you lost your swagger? How long has it been since you stood on the western side of the Jordan? Or better said, stood in the shadow of the cross. And said, look what God did for me. These people were convinced. Convinced to the core. That no matter what tomorrow brought... God had already proven his loyalty and faithfulness to them. Are you convinced? Can you join the chorus of the convinced and say with the Apostle Paul, I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Glory days happen to the degree that we place our trust in the finished work of Christ. Glory days happen to the degree that we place our trust in the finished work of Christ. And we let the finished work of Christ on the cross define and refine us. You at your best are a rescued, redeemed child of God. That's who you are. Male, female, old, young, rich, poor, employed, unemployed. All of those are characteristics. But you at your best, here's who you are. You are a redeemed child of God. There's something in you that God wants in his promised land. comes down to that you deserve to swagger a bit me he would do that for me let that define you let that refine you if he would do that if he would get you out of the wilderness into the promised land with such power don't you think he'll walk you into your tomorrow with equal power he didn't bring you over here to let you flounder fail Having given his own son, will he not also along with him righteously and graciously, Paul said, give you all things? Is the cross not a demonstration of his utter loyalty to you? Stand firm. Look at you. Look at you. There's no mud on your sandals. You're sanctified. You're cleansed. Every sin washed away. There's no stain on your robe. Your past is past. God does not see that. You are a card-carrying recipient of God's grace, an inhabitant of the promised land. 
Let it go deep. Let it sink deep within you. Come to think of it, there may be debt clocks in heaven. And I can't speak for everybody. But as far as the clock that does a lot of ticking that has beneath it the name Max Locato, beneath that there is a sign that says, paid in full, no more debt, Jesus Christ. May the same be said about yours. Lord, thank you for grace. Thank you that even in the book of Joshua, we find the gospel. Thank you for the hope. May that hope be our greatest hope, Lord. We offer this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. And all the church said, Amen.